that's I, I'm sure this is a nut you're going to try and crack when you do the uh, the course. But how do we really know what Jesus taught, right? I mean, you get this all the time, and I know that, that you've written several books. You're going to go into this in your course. Can we honestly trust, looking at these Gospels, you know, I'm with you on the text critical and looking at this as, as a skeptical kind of what Jesus really said. Did he really talk about his death, burial, and his resurrection, or is this ad hoc or something added, you know, to him after his death by the authors? In several places, it seems to give that nod that the author is putting into Jesus' mouth, or some of his parables sound like something the, the temple's already destroyed and they're writing some type of parable, which makes sense of that kind of criteria. How do we know that this is what Jesus taught? Yeah, well, it is a very complicated question, a long question, and I, and I, it's a subject of several of my books. And so um, I won't give you the book length answer here. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. <laughs> um, the basic answer is that you treat the Gospels like you treat any other historical source. Many, um, many people object to that. Conservative Christians think you cannot treat them like any other source because they're inspired by God. But historians understand that inspired by God is a, is a theological claim, and historians don't base their analysis on one theology or another. They don't base it on a theological claim. So uh, the conservative Christians object to it, but also people on the, on the, on the far left object to it as well, because they say, look, the, the Gospels are in the Bible. You can't, you can't trust the Bible sources because I mean, they're just, they're, they're, you know, they're not historical sources. They're biblical sources. They're theological books. Um, my response, and I think both groups are completely wrong. Um, it is true that Matthew is in the New Testament. Matthew, though, did not think he was writing the scriptures of the New Testament. Matthew was writing a book about Jesus based on stories he heard. Yes, he believed in Jesus. Uh, uh, but he still was recording events that he heard about. That's what a historical source is. Unless he's making up everything whole cloth, then he's basing it on stories that were in circulation. That's true of Mark, Luke, and John as well. Um, and so since they're basing it on stories that have been circulating, these are historical sources that are treated like other sources that contain hearsay, that contain inaccuracies, that contain contradictions, that contain implausibilities. We have lots of ancient sources like that. We don't discount them as historical sources. We don't say, well, you can't trust anything. Then. I mean, you can say that, but you could say that about any, you know, if you, if you have a, um, suppose you have a soldier uh, from the Second World War. Um, suppose you have two soldiers. Suppose you have a German soldier and an American soldier from the Second World War that are both describing the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and let's say these soldiers weren't actually in the Battle of the Bulge, but they heard them from buddies, okay? Uh, so if you're trying to reconstruct what happened at the Battle of the Bulge, do you ignore sources like that? Oh, yeah, but, you know, the German has his German view, and he thinks, you know, the American has the American view. So, like, you can't use them because they're biased. Of course not. You look at what they have to say. You compare them to one another. You, you can look at plaus plausibilities and you do a historical analysis that's based on, do you have independent attestation of events? Is it is something clearly expressing the bias of one party or another? Is another, you know, I mean, you, these are the kinds of things you look at mm -hmm. when you're doing the Second World War, the historical Jesus. And so you can't just throw out the Gospels because they're in the Bible because the authors didn't know they were writing the Bible. They were just writing stories of Jesus they heard. Before we move forward on this, it's really interesting. Is what if one views the gospels, the gospel genre, not in historiography at all? What if, what if they're looking at them in a more mythic, um, some mythic category or something that maybe looks similar? Matthew and Luke kind of has a biographical look to it, cradle to grave, but Mark and John don't. So, what if, what if we're looking at the genre and it's not? you know, we're not looking at it as historiography. Can we then approach this and be, wouldn't that cause people to be more skeptical, I guess, on what we're reading as, as factual? And in that question, I guess, is like, you're taking the oral tradition kind of route that there's like stories and oral things that are coming into the gospels. There are other scholars, I'm sure you're aware, that try to go, well, we don't, we don't think that we should take the oral 
um, the oral tradition route into what we're reading in the Gospels? They take more of a literary approach or something else. What are your thoughts about that? Well, those are two very big questions. Um, and I'd say they're, they're questions that are different from each other. The first has to do with the genre of the Gospels. And, you know, if you want to go grab it, like I think you said, the mythical route. Right. Uh, so I don't think what you do is you kind of choose something. You know, you pick something out of the air. I think you do what you do is you read a lot of ancient literature and you try to see um, how literature works. So you have all sorts of different kinds of writings from the ancient world. You've got philosophers, you've got historians, you've got biographers, you've got people writing religious texts, you've got people writing myths, you've got people, you know, you've got, uh, I mean, you've got, you've got hundreds of different kinds of writings. And so um, what you do is you read, you read massively and you try to figure out, well, how does this kind of, uh, how does this kind of group of writings work together? Like you have groups that are trying to do historiography, like suppose you've got histories of Rome. Okay, so how do they work? You know, their history. And so they're similar because they have this characteristic, this kind of, this, these are the characteristics. They have, they have lots of things different from each other, but they have these characteristics that hold them together as a genre of literature. And you have these other things. You've got these, you've got these myths, and this is how they work. Boom, 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 boom. And, and you've got poetry. You know, you've got epic poetry. This is what epic poetry looks like. And so this is what you do with modern literature, of course. You've got short stories. You've got limerick poems. You've got biographies. You got histories, you got sports page articles, you got things, and like all of these genres have things in common with each other. But the only way to know it is to read a bunch of them to see what the things in common are. And then if you find it, if you pick up a book, suppose you pick up a book and it doesn't have a cover on it, but you're reading this thing, you're trying to figure out what this thing is. Well, you look at what's written in it and you decide, is this a biography? Is this a science fiction novel? Is this a collection of poems? Right? Because you know what the genres are. Okay? So when you approach the Gospels, that's what you do. You've, got, you've read widely in Greek and Roman literature, and you ask, what is this like? Is it like myths? Is it like, uh, Rome, like histories of Rome? Is it, um, you know, is it epics? Is it, what, what is it like? And so scholars who do that for a long time now have said, look, basically these are biographies. You know, there are a lot of biographies that do not begin with the birth of a person. Uh, biographies can begin in mid-story if they want to. Um, and so uh, a bio so there are certain generic features to biographies uh, that, um, that biographers talk about, Plutarch, Suetonius, etc. We have, we have biographies, and they're pretty darn similar to the Gospels. The Gospels are different, but they're not, a, they're not sui generis. They're not like their own thing. They're very much like biographies, especially biographies of religious people. Um, you know, they, they are far more like um, uh, the, the biography of Apollonius of Tiana than they're like, um, like Hesiod's myths about Zeus, you know. So, so it's, I, I, think, I think they are, they are biography. Um, mo most biographies, uh, biographers are basing their work on uh, stories that they've heard. Sometimes written sources, sometimes stories. But Plutarch, for example, will talk about what he's heard about this person or that, this person. He's heard this story. He's heard that story. These are the different versions that he's heard, and he reports them because he, he's heard them. In the ancient world, almost everything, uh, all, all traditions were passed along orally because most people were illiterate. Um, my view is that if um, Christianity is spreading throughout the Roman Empire, uh, as it had to do, as it had to do. It started out in Jerusalem. By the end of the first century, there were Christian communities that were scattered throughout Judea and up in Samaria, up into Syria, over into what's now Turkey, Asia Minor, um, uh, over in Italy, uh, down in North Africa, possibly in Alexandria, possibly as far away as Spain. I mean, they, there are Christian communities in all these places. Most of the people converting are illiterate. So how are people converting people to believe in Jesus? Word of mouth. How could you not have oral traditions? I mean, what, and, and you, have some, you have some independent sources that tell very similar stories about Jesus. So they can't all be making it up because they, they're all similar stories.